Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Stuart Nunnally to the show today. He is a partner in the dental practice of Nunnally and Freeman. He is one of the few people, I would say, not only in the United States, but in the world that is doing revisionist dentistry, whole systems dentistry, and is looking after every facet of how what goes on in the mouth affects the body and what goes on in the body affects the mouth. Some years ago, he suffered from Lou Gehrig's disease and found out that it had something to do with the kind of dentistry that was in his own mouth, unbeknownst to him. I have gone through a full dental revision with him, so I can tell you that what we speak about today is true. I found out about Dr. Nunnally when I went into my own dentist in Los Angeles to find out that I was losing my front tooth, that it was being reabsorbed, and that the doctor in Los Angeles wanted to do a root canal, which I refused. I was horrified <laughs> that I was losing my front tooth. I didn't know about dental revision. I knew I wanted my mercury fillings out. I didn't know that the other fillings in my mouth also had toxic materials that were impacting my health. I learned about cavitations, about vitamin C, and many other things that Dr. Stuart Nunnally is going to talk to us about today. I want to tell you just a little bit about him. He trained at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, where he graduated from, along with Dr. Freeman. He is a member of the ADA, the Academy of General Dentistry, the Texas Dental Association, the Heart of Texas Dental Society, the American Dental Society of Anesthesiology and the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. He says on his website that they provide a wonderful standard of care. And I have to tell you, it is a demarcation in the standard of care in my experience, going to a doctor or a dentist. It is phenomenal. I even learned that there's a whole new way that we can clean our teeth. I'm very proud to bring you Dr. Stuart Nunley. Welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. Thank you so much, Kim. What a beautiful introduction, and I appreciate that. I want to start with the context where you thought that you were a holistic dentist, only to find out that you got very sick. And what happened to you? Give the audience a context for what this is about. Sure. You know, I did feel like I was a holistic dentist because when I got sick 10 years ago, I had not put a mercury-containing filling in for 20 years at that time. And I really thought that was sort of what encompassed being a holistic dentist. But 10 years ago, I began to have neuromuscular issues. We thought after months of being tested that it, it truly uh, had the possibility of being ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. I actually never formally got that diagnosis, and I'm convinced that I did not have ALS, but I certainly had the symptoms of it. But when I got referred to the... Uh, ALS Center in Houston, I called a dentist who had lost his license uh, years earlier for telling people to have their mercury fillings and root canal teeth removed, and his name was Hal Huggins. I called him because at that point in my life, I was looking for any hope this side of heaven that I could find. And so I met him, and under his auspices, I had all of my dentistry removed and changed out. We measured me to see where I was on the mercury end of things, and my mercury levels were about as high as I've ever seen. How were they measured, Dr. Nunley? At that time, we did what was called a DMPS challenge test, where the drug or the chemical known as DMPS is delivered through an IV, and then... You collect your urine and you determine how much mercury is in there. And I actually doubled the level that the laboratory had ever measured at that point, which was an indicator that I had, of course, been working around mercury for years, removing mercury fillings, but I had been taking no precaution myself. And it had accumulated in my body to the level that I began to have these neuromuscular issues. Would you say now, knowing what you know, that unbeknownst to most dentists, a little strap around their mouth is not going to be enough? Well, that's absolutely the truth. We know that the little paper masks that dentists wear do nothing to protect them from mercury exposure. Dentists and their staff and the patients literally sit in a little mercury vapor fog when the mercury is removed unless, when the mercury fillings are removed, unless there are special precautions being taken in the office. And all of those can be implemented. 
They're not that difficult to do, but they require several things. One would be sort of an industrial strength negative ion generator, which is situated right behind the dentist and the patient. And that blows over the patient as the dentistry is being done, and it literally pushes any of the mercury vapor toward the foot of the patient where another collector, a mercury collector, is situated. That's one of many parts of the protocol that I would suggest following in order to avoid exposure, and especially for dentists. You know, Kim, as dentists, we have some of the absolute worst neurological history of any profession. We're, we're number one in divorce. We're number one in suicide. We're number one in depression. And I have to think, although, uh, of course, the American Dental Association would disagree with me, but I have to think that the majority of that is due to our exposure to mercury. That's fascinating. I always wondered why that analysis was done. You know, why, number one, in divorce, suicide, and depression. I've wondered well, about that for years. I never correlated it to mercury. I think it is. And we know in the laboratory, for example, with experimental animals, if you want to induce depression in an animal or an autoimmune issue, you typically do it with a mercury-containing compound. And so as dentists, we're exposed to that day in and day out. And it's interesting. Some dentists, I have a few dentists who are in their 80s, and they seem to be functioning very well neurologically. I have others, including classmates, who are having terrible neurological issues, and we've certainly had suicides out of my dental class of 1980. We know, actually, that there's a subset of the population who is very susceptible to mercury, who simply don't detoxify it well. I know I'm in that category and uh, I have a feeling, of course, that many of my peers also are in that category and just simply cannot detoxify it. Why is it, do you think, that many of the dentists who use a rubber dam when they're taking out mercury, some of them have trivialized the process saying, look, we have a rubber dam. It's like infinitesimal amounts of vapor if there is any, quote, end quote, and they're making a big deal about it. Why is it so trivialized and why do the dentists who really, I believe most of them are for the patient well-being, would say that the rubber dam that they're using to remove the mercury is sufficient. Well, it's trivialized because the research is not widely known on the fact that the mercury vapor penetrates the rubber dam. And so unless there is some sort of an evacuation device underneath the rubber dam, it penetrates. The other solution to that is to use what's called a nitrile dam, and there's far less penetration of the mercury vapor through that dam than there is through a rubber dam. So I think usually when when those sorts of protocols are, well, when they're shunned by people, it's simply because they're not aware of research that's been done to demonstrate their effectiveness. And probably it's also so narrowly known that it's not really considered part of a standard of care. Correct. The science of Correct. it. Now, I want you to share a bit about what you do with cavitations, what they are, and why you go through the protocol that you do with people. Sure, I'd love to. And let me just begin with a quick anecdote, because I'll have to say 15 years ago, I had never heard the term cavitation. But I happened to be at a brain longevity conference about 15 years ago in Tucson, I was the only dentist there. I was sitting next to a wonderful physician, a lady physician from North Carolina, and she began to ask me, she found out I was a dentist, and she said, do you do cavitations? And well, of course, I said, of course I do. And she said, you do? And I said, yes, I do them all day. Well, I didn't know what she was talking about. I thought she was talking about cavities. She went on to tell me, she said, well, we have this clinic in North Carolina, which is a holistic, integrative medical clinic, and we see people from all over the world. And she said, I can't tell you how often we're unable to make a diagnosis or determine how their disease came on. But she said, I can't tell you how often the patients have gotten well when we send them to have their cavitations cleaned out. I knew at that point we weren't talking about the same thing. So I began to do some research into cavitations. Cavitation is a hole in the jawbone that's filled with bacteria. 
And typically, the bacteria arrive there because when the tooth is extracted, the bacteria from the mouth 